Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, anyone here um, from Australia? Struth, you seen the cricket score? Oh, such a shame. Oh. As somebody who went to Melbourne in 2006 and uh, saw a pretty poor England performance, it's a, it's a great day to not be Australian. Uh, no, 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 steady on. No, no, no. It's going to be fine this time. The early start won't crumble. It's going to be fine. Um, I'm Cornish. I'm using my English voice, but I really am from here. I'm from up the road. Any Cornish people here? Yeah. Oh, so many. Oh, it's hard not to get emotional about that. I remember the first time at Adjana Beach started, and I couldn't believe there was a conference in Cornwall. And then I came here, and there were people here that talked like me with my real voice. And I was kind of pleasantly surprised. Now there's loads of people here. It's awesome. Um, so, hello. Oh, sugar. What happened then? Yes, that's fine. I'm talking too much. So, uh, hello, I'm Steve Smith. Um, I'm going to talk about continuous delivery and the theory of constraints. Um, uh, but first of all, um, I'd like to talk about um, uh, Chris O'Dell, who is due to be a speaker here this year but can't be here. She's not well. Uh, Chris O'Dell is a friend of mine. She's a wonderful person, a fountain of knowledge about continuous delivery, and I'm hoping she'll be here um, next year. Uh, so if you've seen um, one of my talks before, uh, many people have seen me speak before, a few, yes, so you'll know from experience that I'll be talking about some of the experiences I've had with clients. Um, I'll have the usual unconvincing arguments and childlike diagrams. Um, I'm really pleased that Agile on the Beach has now made public Q&A optional at my urging. Um, so I am happy to take public questions afterwards if we have time. We probably won't because I'm going to put in some stupid jokes at some point to amuse myself. Um, but if we, run, if we do run out of time, or if you would prefer to speak um, privately, then just come and find me afterwards. Um, I'll be at the beach tonight, and I'll be on the ship tomorrow. So um, I'm a continuous delivery consultant. Yes, uh, that's me. So I'm the author of Measuring Continuous Delivery, which is a book on LeanPub that describes how to make better decisions when adopting continuous delivery. Uh, I'm the co-author of a children's A to Z of continuous delivery with the awesome Denise Yu, who's here and speaking here, and is a great person. I also co-wrote Build Quality in a couple of years ago. And I'm a long-term associate of Equal Experts, which is a network of independent um, software consultants uh, that deliver high-quality software. Um, they're sponsoring, again this year, they're a lovely group of people, I've worked for many years. They have a UK Southwest office now, which is very exciting. Although, of course, for the Cornish people in the room, it's not really in the Southwest, it's north of the Tamar. It's in the north, but they already had a UK North office, so I guess they just picked the next name they could think of. So I'm a little bit sad about that, but I try not to think about it. Uh, okay, so... Um, I didn't mean that, by the way. I'm not really sad about it. If I say something other than continuous delivery, I'm probably not telling the truth. Uh, implementing continuous delivery is all about improving the stability and throughput of production deployments until you can meet product demand. That's it. That's all you have to do. But it's phenomenally hard. And that's because you have to apply all of these principles and all of these practices to the complex adaptive system that is your organization. So Tendai's keynote this morning was absolutely spot on when he talked about uh, product design and development not being an ordered linear process. That's exactly what continuous delivery is like, just in a slightly different space. Tendai is a bit upstream of this. He's in the uh, earlier stages of value stream. Um, continuous delivery is all about the technology value stream. It's all about that space between code and customer, the build, testing, and operations activities that we all love so much. Within your own company, you'll be surrounded by people telling you that uh, Amazon's nothing to worry about, that we can just do it with some off-the-shelf package, and that their ideas are, are going to work out just fine. First of all, Amazon is definitely something to worry about. Um, even if you have a bakery in Cornwall, like, I'd be a bit worried about Amazon, and they don't have a bakery yet, but they're probably thinking about it on their roulette wheel of companies they want to take over. Um, what should we do today? Yes, we'll, do, we'll take that bakery in Penryn. Uh, why not? Uh, we can do anything. Um, uh, what, else am I, what else am I mocking? Oh, yes. So it's off-the-shelf solutions. No, that won't work. You know, I had a client. We spent ages building a platform. Then they replaced it with an off-the-shelf platform that doesn't work. Like, of course it won't. Because you're trying to make changes in a complex space, right? So there's no recipe. So how do you identify the major impediments in this space? And how do you select the experiments that will give you the best chance of success? How do you avoid spending weeks, months, or maybe even years on, the, on technology and organizational changes that ultimately have no impact on your time to market? 
So the advice on how to implement continuous delivery has changed a lot over the years. Uh, back in 2010, in the original continuous delivery book by Dave and Jez, they talked about using the plan, do, check, act cycle by uh, Dr. Deming, who were credited in turn to uh, uh, Mr. Schuhart. And uh, Dave and Jess talked about using the plan, do, check, act cycle to um, implement a maturity model around configuration and release management best practices. So um, nine years on, and the Deming cycle is absolutely the right thing to do. It's a great way to run structured experiments that are aligned with the scientific method. Like, that's all awesome. Uh, at the same time, we now know that maturity models are hocus-pocus and should be avoided at all costs, and they're a terrible idea. Uh, that this notion of like a step-by-step -step linear process is entirely at odds with the notion of continuous improvement. Uh, so maturity models bad, Deming cycle good. And we need more advice than this. This isn't enough. I can actually tell you from experience that using the plan, do, check, act cycle alone to automate the world uh, will not help you get to where you need to go to meet product demand. Uh, whatever you do, don't do what I did a few years ago at a British telco where I was working as a tech lead on uh, six extreme programming teams, and we built 28 applications that would come together to form this network activation platform. Uh, obviously, this isn't the real name of the company. I have to disguise it because, you know, um, I still live in London and they're still in London, uh, but they know who they are. Um, they're probably here um, looking at this going, yes, yes, this is exactly what we did all those years ago. Um, so, uh, yes, everything was fine in development land and kind of okay in product land, but um, in the technology value stream, we had a ton of problems. So uh, we had, what do we have? We had uh, a first stage of uh, functional testing. Then we had um, integration testing. We had a 10-day integration test for regulatory reasons that I never challenged. Everyone said Ofcom says it has to be 10 days. Uh, 10 years on, I wish I just phoned Ofcom to check if they actually did want that. I would do that now. Um, and then the operations teams did like their black magic that you have to do with on-premise deployments and then uh, production deployment would eventually happen and customers would possibly be delighted. Uh, but in testing and operations, uh, we had a lot of problems. We had some Solaris environments that were manually provisioned and, you know, often had problems. Uh, releases uh, went for a Perl script that um, didn't quite work, like all Perl scripts. Uh, Oracle database, by the way, that's one of the few times I'll mention a tool if I do it only be to criticize it. I don't like talks that talk about tools, I tend to avoid them. Um, I actually am a, a reviewer for Agile on the Beach, and I can tell you that if your talk title includes the name of a tool already, I'm like, oh, you've already like, got a mountain to climb with me, uh, because tools inevitably, A, will all work just fine other than WebSphere, and B, uh, tools eventually just enrage you. You know, oh, I'm not even looking at the script anymore, forget that. I went to uh, visit Google recently, forget it. I went to Google recently, talked to them about a Google Cloud client that we share, and they, I think they were expecting me to get on my knees and go, Google Kubernetes engine is the best. And instead, I sat there trying to eat the nuts out of the free food drawers. And I was like, G Suite's really nice. Uh, are there any pies in the canteen today? I, think I, was, I, I fear I was a disappointment to them. So yes, no tools. You know, they're all just fine, except for WebSphere. Uh, what else happened here? So production releases took eight hours, of course. There was a 10-step uh, semi-automated release implementation plan. Uh, who else here works with release implementation plans? Just me, working big enterprises, a couple of us. We're friends. I like release implementation plans. The more steps, the better. It's great. It's, I always like to you know, praise the things that I don't like. It's like change freezers. We should have more of them. I miss the old days. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I really should stop saying these things on video. Um, do people think I mean it? Development teams um, had responsibility for features here. Of course we did. And operations teams had responsibility for reliability. So there was a real tension there for some mysterious reason. Uh, OK, our lead time was 34 days uh, from version control to production. And uh, like um, some kind of idiot, I was like, OK, so I've read the continuous delivery book. I work with Dave Farley. I understand all of this. I'll volunteer to build a deployment pipeline. So that's mistake number one. You should set out to achieve better outcomes faster, not build a pipeline. That's not an outcome. And there was no product turner around, so I arbitrarily set a target lead time of 14 days. So that's mistake number two. We haven't even started coding yet. Uh, good. So here's a checklist of technology capabilities you should consider when adopting continuous delivery. Uh, you can easily build your own capability model. It's easy. You sit at your dining room table at 2 in the morning and just write some stuff down. Uh, these blue boxes were the capabilities that we already had. So we had test-driven development. We had um, trunk-based development. And we had continuous integration. And yes, that does mean six teams of developers were all committing to trunk at least once a day, because continuous integration is a practice, not a tool. 
You can put CI in the URL all you like, but it's a practice. Uh, and it was actually in place here because we had subversion for trunk best development rather than Git. Don't you miss the days when bad tools encourage you to do good things because they were doing bad things themselves, rather than now when we have good tools that encourage us to do bad things because they do the bad things really well? Yes, I am telling you to stop using Git. That's exactly the message we're trying to get across there. All right, so we ran a lot of experiments over 18 months loosely based around the plan, do, check, act cycle to figure out what was working and what wasn't. And um, over 18 months, we implemented a, a fully automated deployment pipeline that we ended up using for 70 applications rather than the original 28, so that was good. Uh, we created a semi-automated database migrator, that was good. And we used branch by abstraction, consumer-driven contracts to incrementally decouple our applications, which was uh, pretty awesome. Uh, let's see, so the build time for a platform version went down from an hour and a half to three minutes. The release time went down to about, um, I don't know, an hour in test environments, previously like something like three hours. So we're doing good stuff, right? Like, yeah lots of useful outputs that we shouldn't be measuring, but we were. And here's a checklist of the organizational capabilities you might want to think about with continuous delivery. We had continuous change reviews because we always pair programmed, and we had teams making decisions for themselves, and we moved to a smaller batch size, and we had better traceability in our changes, and interestingly, we had an iteration manager who kept pushing for the functional testing and the integration testing to happen as quickly as possible. So remember that bit for later on, please. All right. So after 18 months of hard, hard work, when I would sleep on the train into work, sleep on the train back and dream about work, which are all awesome leading indicators of burnout, um, we got to 31 days. So we, we're at 34, we want to get to 14, and we get to 31. So by our yardstick of continuous delivery, I failed. And I say I because it was my primary responsibility. I had a, we have a great bunch of people, but it was on me, and we, we, I failed. We never knew what the major contributor was to this lead time, why it was so hard to improve on. And that's because we never really looked, because it was, you know, back in the old days of continuous delivery. Uh, there were lots of theories, you know, the operations teams take too long, Steve. The database administrators take too long. The 10-day integration test, it takes more than 10 days, Steve. And I, I just never knew. I didn't look hard enough. All right. So what have we learned since then that we, I, wish we'd known back in the day? So in 2015, Chez Duran Maleski and Barry O'Reilly published The Enterprise, which is somehow underrated. It's a great book, a marriage of lean product development, continuous delivery that I um, can't recommend highly enough. And primarily, it's because they introduced the improvement car to, into the space of product development and continuous delivery in a way that hadn't been done before. So if you've not heard of it, the improvement carter is just a great way to um, work towards continuous improvement. It's kind of a loose framework that fits around your existing ways of working, and it encourages you to use like iterative incremental steps to a goal. And this just dovetails beautifully with a continuous delivery program. And in 2018, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, Jez, and Gene Kim uh, published Accelerate, which is easily the book of 2018 and just got so much great stuff in there. It gives us a st statistically significant um, underpinning for continuous delivery practices and adjacent essentials like lean product development. And there's just all kinds of nuggets in there, like the importance of architecture on testability and just a lot of uh, reinforcement or confirmation bias, possibly. Who would have thought that trunk-based development would have a statistically significant relationship with organizational success? Only those of us who've done it before and seen it succeed, possibly. Actually, I've been at Agile on the Beach for a couple of hours, and no one yet has come up to me and had a branching debate. So if you're that person like, lying in wait for me, like it happens every year. Like You don't have to wait till the beach. It can be now. Just storm the stage. It'll be fine. You know, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, no? Maybe they're um, watching the cricket. Is it still going well? I've not seen a thumb, oh, I'm getting, oh, okay. Still free down, they're recovering. Those Australians, always recovering. So, uh, let's see, the continuous delivery book taught us plan, do, check, act. The Lean Enterprise book taught us the improvement carter and accelerators validated that direction of travel. But I don't think that advice is enough. So in um, 2018, um, I published, uh, finally finished continuously publishing my own book, uh, Measuring Continuous Delivery. Um, I told my wife that it would take six months um, of four nights a week, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. to finish this book. It took me two years. 
uh, of 11 p.m. to 2 a.m., so I'm still learning how to sleep again. Um, if you're thinking of writing a book right now part-time and you have a young family like me and a full-time client like me, um, I have some free advice for you. Don't do it. Just write a blog post and go out into your garden and enjoy some time with your children. Uh, that's what I should have done, uh, maybe. But um, uh, during the whole process of writing the book, I thought really hard about what advice I'd give to someone like just starting out today. And I believe that we need better advice than is currently um, uh, available, that we need to help people have a way to visualize deployment throughput to generate insights into their progress. We need a way to identify the major impediments in your technology value stream to quickly home in on what should be improved immediately. And we need a way to select the experiments, the technology and organizational changes that are most likely to help you with those major impediments. So if we don't do that, there's a high probability of suboptimal outcomes, stakeholder dissatisfaction, and your team, your organization remaining in discontinuous delivery. And we don't want anyone to stay there, even though we do all seem to spend an awful lot of time there. Okay, so this is a uh, deployment throughput indicator. This is a technique I came up with a couple of years ago. Um, and it's just about visualizing lead time and interval together. So the time from version control to production and the time between production releases as well. And we can see all kinds of interesting things in the trends here. Uh, so here, I've applied this back onto the network activation data from um, many years ago now. So uh, this is where we also were trying to hindsight bias goggles. I actually thought about getting some for the talk and handing them out, but I couldn't source them quickly enough. Uh, and I wasn't sure what size goggles I should get for people. Uh, so the x-axis here is our 18 months of um, hard, hard work. And the y-axis is calendar days. Do we have anyone in the audience who's colorblind? If so, I can have a chat with you afterwards about the information. Or medium that's more suitable to you? No? Okay, cool. Um, so the orange line here is like our average lead time, the time between a commit to trunk and its eventual production release. And the green line is the average number of days between production releases. So straight away, it would have been awfully useful to have this back in the day, because we can see for the first nine months that we have a higher lead time than interval. Can someone tell me what that means, please? No? Okay. Well, what it means is that we were releasing faster than we could build and make the thing, right? We're sprinting just to stand still. No wonder we had people so stressed and people burning out. We were releasing to production every 21 to 28 days, but it took us 34 days to make and test the thing. Uh, we have an improvement here. We got down to 28 days in our lead time. That's lovely, but that was a mirage. That was because we crunched to get a couple of uh, releases in for an end of year change freeze, which is exactly what you should do. Um, and uh, see, you're getting better. You're picking up. I didn't mean that. That's good. That's good. So I don't mean that at all. Stop doing that. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm way behind on time as well. This is going really well. Um, so 31 days is the actual improvement that we made after 18 months. We got from 34 to 31 days. Although interestingly, we can see that uh, interval and lead time started to meet up. So I like to think that all of the improvements we made in terms of building a deployment pipeline, like removing rework, removing toil, they got us to a sustainable pace. So yes, it was only 31 days, uh, which isn't awesome, but at least we're not sprinting to stand still, uh, st uh, sprinting to stand still anymore. Okay, so this can help us you know, create some insights into our progress with continuous delivery, but it doesn't tell us what the major impediment was, right, or how we might have tackled it. We can do that with the theory of constraints. So the theory of constraints is a management paradigm by Dr. Eli Goldratt. And it's all about improving organizational throughput by tackling a uh, small number of constraints in a, in a homogenous workflow. And this is directly applicable to continuous delivery because a technology value stream is a homogenous workflow. The keynote from Tendive is about product design, which is heterogeneous. You should not use the theory of constraints there. You might use something like uh, Don Reinertsen's principles of product development flow. But down here uh, in uh, build, testing, and operations, we want things to be invariable. We want things to be deterministic. So um, this is all laid out in the goal, by the way. Who, uh, who's read the goal? Uh, more, hand, more hands need to go up. Everyone read it tonight, please, on the beach. Thank you. Uh, I read it once a year or so at the moment. It's just a great book, packed full of insights. And um, it's like this business management novel thing that I think it took like 20 publishing houses to actually publish this thing that was kind of a novel about business management. It was kind of funny. Uh, so the central premise of the theory of constraints is to iteratively increase 
the capacity of a constraint until you can balance the flow of items according to product demand. The theory of constraints teaches us that a non-constraint is any resource with capacity greater than market demand. And its level of utilization will be controlled by a constraint elsewhere. It also tells us that trying to increase the capacity of uh, a non-constraint is a waste of time and money because it won't do anything to tackle the queue of work in front of a constraint nor the starvation of work after a constraint. What does that mean for continuous delivery? It means that in your technology value stream, there are a number of unconstrained activities that take less time to complete than the target lead time, and you shouldn't try to improve them too much. Uh, non uh, what next? A constraint. So a constraint is a, any resource with capacity that's uh, equal to or less than market demand. And its level of utilization will limit the throughput of non-constraints. So we can see that here. Our first resource has maximum capacity. Our second resource is the constraint. It's got reduced capacity. And resources after the constraint can only go as fast or have as much capacity as the constraint itself. Losing an hour at a constraint means losing an hour for the entire organization. It is very expensive. All right, so in continuous delivery land, we can say that if a team is in a state of discontinuous delivery, in its technology value stream, there will be at least one and at most a few constrained activities with a duration that is too long for a target lead time to be achieved. Not your current lead time, but the target, where you want to be. And a constrained activity controls how often non-constrained activities can happen. And losing time in a constrained activity is never OK. So again, here in this fictional value stream, uh, we've got a second activity that is our constraint. And then that controls the frequency of which we can run future activities. There are plenty of reasons why an activity might be constrained. It might occur in the queue time for an activity, how long we wait for it to start. In preparation time, how long it takes to set up. In process time, how long it takes to actually do the thing. Or in assembly time, how long we have to wait for another parallel activity to complete. Uh, here are a couple of examples that I'm sure we've all come across before. Uh, so handoffs is always a good one. Whenever one team hands over a release candidate to another, there's a queue there. It might be an email queue. It might be a Jira ticket. It might be, a, I don't know, like a wave to each other. <laughs> but um, that's a, there's an invisible queue there. Right? And that's taken up more time than you realize, I'm willing to bet. Uh, environment contention is always a good one. We have lots of the really big um, enterprise companies that I work with. There are multiple teams all trying to use the same test environment, and they have to wait on each other. And again, there's an invisible queue there that everyone ends up um, getting stuck in. And staff illiquidity is something that um, I've just come across time and time again with many clients. It's where there's a limited number of key personnel that actually have the skills necessary to perform a critical task. That might be writing a release implementation plan. It might be signing off on a cab. It might be uh, hmm, provisioning test data. It might be there's only one exploratory tester. What other constraints can people think of? We're out, well, I'm running late, but what the hell? Other constraints folks have had? Only one person has the password. Only one person has the password. That's next to the one. Thank you. Yes. I mean, hmm. Maybe I should say skills illiquidity there, or knowledge illiquidity rather than staff. That's a good, I'll change that for the next time round. Thank you very much. That's a great one. Anything else? Time zones. Oh, that, mm, yeah, yeah, that could be a thing. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's interesting. OK. Hibri, you're like waving your hand like, what does that even mean? Magic. It, magic's a constraint. Is it a? Lead Devils in Toronto? Yes. Could only, yes. Yes? Oh, I see. OK. OK, so well, that's a bit of staff liquidity, and it's the time zone thing. And ma I'm hearing magic was played a role as well. That's good to know. OK. Uh, why would you try to destroy the talk by introducing magic? That's not part of this presentation, hey, Brie. Uh, stop doing this to me every time. OK, so uh, if we apply a theory of constraint lens um, back onto network activation, can we figure out what the hell happened? And yes, we can. So here's like a per activity lead time breakdown. This is one of my famous childlike visualizations that I like to use. Um, so our x-axis is, again, um, our 18 months. And our y-axis is calendar days. 
Um, and the blue bit is the first function of test activity. The red bit is that 10-day integration test people were so worried about. And the yellow is the production activity. And our dotted green line is our target lead time of 14 days. And straight away, you can see that the constraint was... Thank you, production. Don't say integration. It's clearly not the biggest one. It's production. Look, the yellow one. Thank you, person who shouted yellow. <laughs> More people sabotaging the talk by shouting out uh, not the one that isn't the largest. That's excellent. Uh, so yes, the production activity was the constraint, and we had no idea that it was. Uh, this would have been awfully useful back in the day, because we never looked at the production activity whatsoever. We thought it was fine, so it clearly wasn't. So the way we can figure out what it actually was is to break this down into queue time and process time, the time waiting for the activity and the time doing the activity. All right, so the lighter colors here are the queue time, uh, the darker colors are the process time. So if we go from left to right and uh, bottom to top, we can see that the queue time prior to the functional testing and the integration testing uh, was slowly eliminated over the 18 months, and not so coincidentally, that saved an average of three days. So this was the thing that went helped us go from 34 to 31 days. And that was because of the iteration manager I mentioned earlier, just hassling testers to start quicker. That's the one change that improved lead time. All of the work I did around technology and organization around the deployment pipeline, that helped remove variability, moved us to a sustainable pace on frequency of deployment and the time it took. But to actually reduce the time it took, it was that one change. And I don't know if the iteration manager knows that. I should tell them, I guess. Uh, the queue time here, obviously, for production is horrible. It's over 50% of our time. And the reason for that was a process that we entirely owned ourselves. Our release manager had to agree on production release dates with an upstream billing system because um, uh, there was like, this complicated process and API coupling and yada, yada, yada. And the paperwork was quite painful. So what they would do is they would um, agree on the production release dates in advance and then publish them out for folks to see. And that's a great example of a local optimization that totally makes sense for that person who was really hardworking and a nice person. But holistically, that's a bad thing because that then locks all of the teams into discontinuous delivery before you've even started. Because what that means is, if your testing runs late, you might push out your release date. But if your testing is getting better and faster and more reliable over time, you're not going to bring the release date in because that's hassle, right? You're going to leave it where it is. So all you're doing then is increasing that queue time out to production. So... Yeah, I do think about that from time to time, like that queue that we never looked at. Bit of a problem. All right, so how does the theory of constraints actually work? We uh, use the five focusing steps. We identify the constraint. We exploit the constraint. We subordinate everything else to the constraint. We elevate the constraint. And then we repeat the process. OK, so identifying the constraint means calculating our target lead time as like a proxy a measure of product demand. And then we calculate which activities, or activity most likely, takes too long for that target to be accomplished. Uh, for example, let's assume we're all working together trying to find and reduce a constraint, and it's our performance test environment. It's a really big company. We're all using the same performance test environment on premise because reasons. And uh, it causes multiple teams to queue up. So how do we tackle that? Well, first of all, that should be the only thing we tackle. If your builds are currently slow, leave them alone. You need to sort out performance testing. If uh, production releases are a bit brittle, unless people are dying, like leave that alone. Focus on performance testing. And this is the first thing the five focusing steps help us to do. It helps us to identify that major impediment. OK, so we need to exploit the constraint, which means saving time. We need to reduce idle time, defective items, and unnecessary items. There's lots of technology and organizational changes in the continuous delivery canon that you could try here. And it's for you to figure out which ones have the best chance of success within um, the context of uh, your organization. But there's a lot of things that you can try. For example, move all the testing activities in front of this performance test environment to make sure it never works on an item that uh, could already have been found to be uh, problematic. Because remember, an hour, lost for the an hour lost in performance testing is an hour lost for the whole organization that you can't get back. We can automate deployments. We might automate the performance tests. We might reduce the number of performance tests. We might increase the number of testing slots so that they run overnight as well as during the day. We might stagger tester lunches so that there's always a tester on hand just in case something breaks. Uh, next, we subordinate everything to the constraint. 
That means limiting the amount of release candidates arriving at this uh, performance test environment that's so problematic. We could use WIP limits here. We could say that there's only a certain amount of tickets that the development teams can work on at a given point in time to prevent us from queuing up release candidates in front of the environment. And if a developer runs out of coding work to do, what should they go and do? Coffee? Coffee? No. <laughs> work on the performance testing. Thank you. Yes. Because that's the constraint. That's the thing that matters. Because developers are paid to solve problems, not write code. Because code is a liability, not an asset, no matter how pretty it is. All right, then we want to elevate um, the constrained activity, which means basi basically means spending money to create time. So in our case, we might hire more testers. We might put our testers on some performance testing training courses, if they wish. And we might pay for better hardware, whether it's on-premise or cloud, just, you know, spend some money, throw hardware at it. And then we repeat the process. We look at the experiments we've run in uh, Plan, Do, Check, Act. We understand the positive impact, if any, they've had on our major impediments. We look at any unintended negative consequences. And then we do it all over again. And uh, we do that until we've got a flow of release candidates out to production that meets product demand. And when you've done that, you're in a state of continuous delivery, and you should throw a party like, well done you. That's great. Of course, removing an internal constraint from your technology value stream means inevitably that an external constraint will emerge, either upstream in product design or downstream in customer sales. But don't worry, have your party. And also, uh, if product demand increases later on, you'll need to decrease your target lead time. And you know, as you drain a lake, you know, more rocks emerge. And then you might have a new constraint. Uh, but you know, enjoy the party, it's fine. That's all in the future. OK, how am I doing? Oh, only 10 minutes behind, excellent. <laughs> so, uh, I shouldn't have trolled the Australians so much at the start in hindsight. How are we doing? Are they still free down? Oh. Oh, oh. So if it's any, oh, always recovering, always recovering. So, uh, what can I tell you? I can tell you that using the theory of constraints with Plan, Do, Check, Act can really work. Uh, uh, over a year ago now, I worked as a continuous delivery consultant at a media organization on their multi-team on-premise uh, media tech media platform. There were six development teams all working concurrently in the same mono repo, uh, uh-oh, and built on top of an enormous vendor product it's really best not to think too much about, like, uh-oh, never look inside the sausage factory, like, oh, how bad is it? Like, oh, don't look. So uh, it's like looking at the sun. Uh, so um, what problems do we have? A, a small selection. Linux environments were manually provisioned, wildly inconsistent, test data sporadically refreshed. Release candidates were mutable, which is always a good thing to see in 2019. That one kept me awake at night. Like, you know, we've done all of our testing. Everything's fine. Let's go to production. No, let's change the jars, first of all. That's totally fine. Um, On-premise servers would run out of disk, uh, run out of memory, or just run away. Uh, Releases ran off a Jenkins script that sometimes made the WebSphere cluster fail. Remember what I said, all tools are fine except for WebSphere, like we had WebSphere. You know, that uh, was excellent. And different testing teams had different suites of end-to-end -end tests, and they were pretty flaky, as all end-to-end -end tests are. Uh, so we had an integration test uh, an activity, we had a release test activity, and then the operations teams did their black magic for their on-premise production deployment, and then that would happen. It was a super complicated technology landscape. It really was a great, and I should say complex. It w was so complex, lots of moving parts. No one had a complete accurate picture. And there was um, a really large blast radius on failure. So it's safe to say that this was a huge challenge. So um, our secret weapon here was that we had a product owner who was super knowledgeable. Uh, they were a test and release manager at the company, had been there for many years. And they were really clear that Production releases happen every three weeks, and they needed to happen weekly in order to meet product demand. And also, this on-premise media tech platform was going to be replaced within two years with this super cool new cloud-based microservices thing. So they didn't want us to boil the ocean trying to get this done. So this is exactly the kind of challenge that I uh, live for, and um, it was great. So um, for the first two months, we actively avoided making any big sweeping changes because we were worried about that blast radius. So we didn't touch WebSphere. We didn't talk to people, we didn't talk to people about their end-to-end -end tests. We built some visualization tools. We asked a lot of questions about release management. 
we tried to build a complete picture of the entire technology of Alistair, which hadn't really been done before. And uh, we knew that our interval was 21 days. We built this lead time breakdown. Um, and again, our, uh, let's see, the blue bar is the first activity, uh, integration testing. The red bar was the second activity, release testing. And the third activity was production. And we could see, as soon as we did this, that release testing was the constraint on the weekly releases. And we went and had a chat with the people that worked there. And we found that there were lots of flaky tests, um, inconsistent change controls, uh, problems, a lot of problems with WebSphere there. Um, we estimated it would take three to six months to improve the, this, this activity. Unfortunately, my first suggestion as a continuous delivery consultant, which was, could we like, please stop using it and just skip it and go to production, was politely declined. Um, so we uh, were very much focused on, we, we have to do this for weekly. But then I had an idea. I um, hypothesized that the release test activity would not be a constraint on fortnightly releases. So if we think back to the improvement carter out of Lean Enterprise, you know, we have our current condition, one release every three weeks. We have our vision of success, one release every week. But your target condition can be one release every fortnight, right? That's your improvement milestone. That's your stepping stone where you can reduce some uncertainty, reduce some ambiguity, and achieve some degree of success. So I met with our product owner, and I pitched the two different options. You know, we can do weekly in three to six months, high risk, high reward, or we can do fortnightly. It will take us maybe a month to six weeks, lower risk, bit, uh, bit lower reward. <coughs> Excuse me. And pleasingly, the product owner went for the second option. It went for fortnightly releases. We met with the operations team. We shared this lead time breakdown with them, and we invited them into a conversation. And to our surprise, they revealed a second constraint on weekly and fortnightly releases, which was that the release manager here was horrifically overworked. They ran the cab. They wrote the release implementation plan. They chased people for release notes. They chased people for call-out rotors. They had a day job on top of release management. And there was no data on this. It didn't show up in our breakdown because this person was so busy, they couldn't actually record any data on what they actually worked on. So we all agreed to work on fortnightly releases with the caveat that we had to tackle the workload for this release manager, which is fine with me because they were the constraint. We weren't going to touch anything else. So this was kind of our technology capabilities model, very similar to network activation at the start. And again, it was subversion. And again, uh, we had continuous integration because of that. So one of the first tickets someone suggested to me was we should totally move to Git. And I was like, yep, that's a good idea. I'll take that card and put it into the backlog and tuck it behind the plant. And we'll think about that later on. We didn't improve any of these. We didn't touch any of these. We didn't build a deployment pipeline. Uh, we didn't build an automated database migrator, even though at times it did mean that some of us had to like sit at our desk with our head in our hands, wailing softly and rocking, like, I really wish release candidates were immutable, or I wish WebSphere was zero downtime. We didn't touch any of this because the five focusing steps tell us that we need to identify the constraint, our release manager, uh, save time for them, reduce the amount of work coming into them, and then try to create more time for them. There wasn't a technology change here that could meet those criteria, so we didn't do it. Uh, these are the organizational capabilities we had. We had a small batch size, but there was lots more to do. And we did. We actually made uh, three changes here. So the first one was that we exploited the constraint. We saved time for the release manager by taking the call-up rotor off their hands, and instead of them chasing everyone individually by email, uh, my delivery lead uh, just created a spreadsheet for the next six months and deliberately set up a fortnightly cadence, a planned future cadence, and said to the six development teams, if you want to move to fortnightly releases, you need to list a developer's name every two weeks for the next six months as best endeavors third line support. And within two days, it was filled out. And the release manager was really happy because that removed a really substantial source of toil for them. They didn't have to do any more emailing. Uh, second, we exploited the constraint again. We saved more time by creating a new release note workflow. And if that sounds unglamorous, that's because it was. I had to bribe the engineers to do the work. I had to persuade our product owner repeatedly that this was the thing that would help us unlock fortnightly releases. And I sat with the four different teams that worked on the existing three different release notes multiple times to help them adjust to this new workflow. And we built a tool. Yes, there was a tool. Um, but what happened was we automatically generated release notes. We created a daily snapshot like weeks in advance so that the release manager could see what was coming down the line. And ultimately, there was a lot more confidence in the process, a lot less toil. 
And again, more time saved for this person. And then finally, we elevated the constraint. We found other staff members to do some of the work for this release manager. They were lifted out of um, the release implementation plan, I believe, for the sake of argument. Uh, is that right? Yes. So we took work off them, and we saved time as well. So here's the deployment throughput indicator for MediaTek, which looks pretty good. We protected lead time, the time from code to customer is 14 days, as planned. And we reduced the uh, deployment interval. We got it down from 21 to 14 days. First of all, we did it as a little experiment. We did two fortnightly releases back to back to see if that would surface any new problems that hadn't been seen before, and it didn't. So then uh, MediaTek permanently went to fortnightly releases, and uh, a year, 18 months on, I checked recently, they're still on fortnightly releases. We did this with three changes. We didn't build a deployment pipeline. We didn't automate database releases. We left WebSphere alone. We haven't even touched that release test activity. It's still going on today. But the reason we haven't tackled it is that we didn't need to do weekly releases, and that's because the product owner found that fortnightly releases were actually enough to meet product demand. So that's another great example of why the improvement cart is a good idea, why incrementally working towards a goal is good, because sometimes an incremental step is actually good enough, and you can adjust your goal. Everyone was happy. It was awesome. Okay, so I have some key learnings that I'd like to share with you. I don't know how I rescued this. I was 10 minutes behind at one point. Amazing. Uh, I've left something out important, probably. Never mind. Um, so uh, Dr. Goldrick was a very quotable man. Uh, one of his uh, uh, best quotes, in my opinion, was, um, automation is good so long as you know exactly where to put the machine. Okay, so continuous delivery is really hard because knowing the what, why, and how of a particular change is not sufficient. You need to know the where and when as well. You actually need to know when not to do something, and that is really hard. Because um, as Dan North would say, uh, we're all romantics with big egos. That was how he kind of challenged the craftsmanship movement a long time ago, and I totally agree with that. Uh, so the theory of constraints will help you identify the constrained activities in your technology value stream, and it will help you select the experiments that are most likely to succeed. Uh, you don't need to automate the world. You don't need to bore the ocean. What you need to do is just balance the flow of release candidates to meet product demand, and remember, you can adjust that target lead time if necessary based on your knowledge of the constraint. Once you're doing that, then you're in a state of continuous delivery, and you should totally have that party. All right, so uh, here are some things you can try for yourself when you're back in the office, when you go back. Here are your takeaways. So uh, first of all, you can establish your target lead time. This is very easy. Just go to your product owner and say, hello, Susan. How often would you like to um, deploy to production? And whatever answer Susan gives, that's the target. That's your vision of success. But remember, you might get there incrementally. If you're currently releasing monthly and Susan says, I want hourly, damn it, then that's fine, but maybe don't try to go from monthly to hourly in one go, right? I don't know why I hit that then. Stupid. Uh, then you want to find your constrained activity. If you have some lead time data, great. Uh, look for the activity with a duration that's longer than your target lead time or is the largest within that um, target lead time. If you don't have any data, that's OK. Look for the activity that has released candidates queuing up in front of it, a starvation of work after it, and people are arguing about it. And if you're doing end-to-end -end testing, I'll tell you right now, it's probably end-to-end -end testing. All right, and then run experiments to save constraint time. You should try to exploit the constraint before elevating the constraint, because you don't need additional budget to save time. You need additional budget to create more time. Uh, there's so many different things that you can try here. There are so many things in continuous delivery literature that you can use to save time in a process. The trick is to know what process it is and then to run really small experiments around those changes to understand quickly what's working and what's not. Okay? You'll be surprised how many changes that you think of here. Now, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you especially to the Cornish people. I'm sorry I used my English voice. I'm a fraud. I'm sorry. Uh, you can do your speaker feedback now. Do you do it in the app? I don't, I don't use apps, so I don't know how the speaker feedback works actually on the beach anymore. You can write down some of the old favorites if you like. Uh, let's see, he spoke too fast, yes. Um, I didn't like the way he persecuted my country, like, yes. <laughs> oh, that was neat, I made that one up then. That's never happened, but I'm totally gonna get that today. Um, I really admire the way he never mentioned the word DevOps, even though it's an increasingly useless word, um, symptomatic of a cargo cult, like, yes, I totally did that. 
And uh, my personal favorite still, um, I enjoyed it, but his sense of humor is far too dry, and even I'm Danish. So thank you very much for coming, and I'll see you on the beach.